brief introduction this morning to the book before we actually get into the verses. Uh, as is stated in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So the author of the letter is the apostle Paul, and the letter is addressed to the saints, the faithful saints at Ephesus, to the saints who are at, who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So uh, we're told who the author is, we're told who the audience is. Just a little bit of background on Ephesus. Uh, Paul briefly visited Ephesus in Acts chapter 18 on his second missionary journey. It's the first time uh, that I'm aware that we, that we are introduced to the city uh, of Ephesus, the people there, and eventually what becomes uh, the church at Ephesus. He doesn't stay uh, very long, so it was just a brief visit. He taught in the synagogue, we read in verse 19 of chapter 18. Priscilla and Aquila were with him, and they stayed behind uh, when Paul returns to Antioch. We read that in verse 19, that they stayed there, not indefinitely, but for some period of time, and Paul returns back to Antioch. So Apollos comes later. We see that beginning in verse 24 of this chapter. Uh, Paul, it says, an Alexandrian by birth and an eloquent man. Uh, he was mighty in the scriptures. Verse 25 says he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately, accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So uh, the information that he had was accurate, uh, but he didn't have all the information. He only knew he was only acquainted with the baptism of John and not the baptism of Christ. But it's Priscilla and Aquila, of course, who take him aside and explain the way of God more perfectly or more accurately uh, to him there in verse 26. So this, of course, is after Paul has left. But, but Apollos does some teaching here uh, in the city of Ephesus uh, in the synagogue. And then on Paul's third journey, he, he has a more extended stay in the city of Ephesus. We're told in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, when he was speaking to the Ephesian elders, giving them his farewell, he said that he, it was, he labored with them night and day for three years. Uh, so we know that he was there in Ephesus for three years. So that was one of the places that he stayed uh, the longest. And he, he typically didn't stay that long in most of the places that he visited. But he spent a good deal of time here in Ephesus. And as we'll see in just a moment, he had a lot of success. And we read about this in chapter 19. Recall that he finds 12 disciples there. But... Guess what? Those 12 disciples are only acquainted with John's baptism, probably because Apollos was the one who instructed them. Uh, Apollos was only acquainted with John's baptism, but Paul takes care of that. Paul uh, asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't even heard whether there is such a thing as a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. And so uh, we read there in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of, of, of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 6 says, Paul laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So he teaches in the synagogue for three months. Uh, verses 8 and 9 tell us that. So he reasons in the synagogue with the Jews, uh, trying to make uh, disciples. And it says they became hardened. And so uh, they initially, apparently, at least for a portion of those three months, were receptive, but they become hardened. And so he takes the disciples and he leaves. And he goes and he teaches in the school of a man named Tyrannus. Uh, and we read there in verse 10 that for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So that's pretty spectacular success, I would say, that all that were in Asia, while he was teaching at the school of Tyrannus, uh, says for two years they heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And then in verse 11, we see that he performs some extraordinary miracles. Uh, verse 12 says that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Uh, you know, extraordinary, right? Just a, a, a piece of fabric that had, had been in contact with him or had, 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 had been in his possession was able just in and of itself to... to to restore uh, the sick, to cause diseases and evil spirits to leave them. Uh, and so we read 
as we go on down through this portion uh, that those who practice magic gathered together. They, uh, as they are converted, they gather together. They brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So uh, a substantial amount of money that was tied up in these books of sorcery or books of magic. And, and they're, they're repenting. They're turning from that and they're turning to God. And so they burn these books. Uh, and it says there in verse 20, so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And so great success. All those who are in Asia, hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is growing mightily and it's prevailing. So uh, Paul's time in Ephesus is, is highly affected uh, and think good things are happening. But unfortunately, uh, as seems to often be the case in this life, all good things must come to an end. And we read on, uh, beginning in verse 23 and 24, about a man named Demetrius, who's a silversmith. And he makes shrines of the goddess Artemis or Diana. And he causes a riot in the city of Ephesus because Paul's teaching is hurting his business. So the temple of Artemis or Diana is in the city of Ephesus. Uh, I read a little bit about that. Uh, some people said that it was one of the Seven man-made wonders of the world at this time, spectacular uh, to behold, magnificent to behold. But it says Artemis in Greek religion, the goddess of wild animals, the hunt and vegetation and of chastity and childbirth. It's kind of an odd combination, but the Greeks had gods for everything. But this particular one, Artemis, was the goddess of wild animals, the hunt, vegetation, chastity, and childbirth. I don't know how those things go together, but that was what they ascribed to her. She's identified by the Romans with the goddess Diana. Uh, if you're familiar with Greek and Roman mythology, the Romans kind of stole the Greeks' mythology and just renamed everything, uh, but basically had the same gods. They just went by different names. So Artemis was the daughter of Zeus and Leto, the twin sister of Apollo. You've probably heard of all of them if you're familiar with Greek mythology. And it says among the rural populace, Artemis was the favorite goddess. So she had a large draw uh, of the common people. Uh, the rural populace. So, so lots of people come to Ephesus to this temple of her to worship her and Demetrius makes shrines to her and that's his livelihood. He makes them out of silver. People buy them so they can take them home and worship them. And so as Paul is teaching all these people throughout Asia and as the word is growing uh, mightily and prevailing, Art of, or excuse me, Demetrius' business is on the decline. Not as many people buying his, his merchandise anymore. And so he becomes upset and he, he gets others in the city uh, in similar trades. Verse 25 says, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of the people saying the gods made with hands are no gods at all. So, so he's upset. He's, he's mad. And so he, he starts a riot. Thankfully, uh, they're able to, to quell or to, to squelch this riot before it gets out of control because uh, the town clerk says, hey, you know, you go and have this riot and we're all going to have a problem on our hands because the Romans are going to come in and they're going to they're going to tamp it down real quick. So we all need to just kind of chill out and disperse. And so that's what happens. But that kind of draws or brings an end to Paul's time. At Ephesus, And so in chapter 20 and verse 1, we see that he leaves for Macedonia. And then there in the latter half of the chapter, he, while he is in Miletus, he calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus to come to them. And he uh, departs and he gives them some, some parting words, some, some farewells uh, there that are recorded for us in chapter 20. So that's just a brief uh, introduction to the city and the church at Ephesus and the things that went on there and transpired there. So now Paul is writing a letter to these saints and faithful who are there. The letter was, is believed to be written around 62 AD or shortly after. Uh, I'm going to put my usual uh, disclaimer in here. The precise date isn't of vital importance. It doesn't change our understanding of the teachings in this book. It is kind of interesting to know approximately a timeline of when these things transpired relative to other things. But every source that I looked at uh, you know, varied from a year to three years, 
but they were all in the, the same general time frame. And that's based uh, some on internal evidence in the books, uh, such as Acts, where it mentions specific people who were in power. We have verses that tell us that Paul was here for two years or for three years or for three months. And so through all that, you can kind of piece together the timeline, but it's not 100% uh, accurate. And there's, in some cases, some, some assumptions that go into that. But just to kind of give us a context here of the timeline, Paul's second missionary journey was around 49 to 52 AD, and that was when he first visited Ephesus. And then his third journey, when he stays for an extended period of time for three years at Ephesus, that was around approximately 53 to 58 AD. But based on statements here in the book of Ephesians, we know that Paul is in prison. Uh, we read that in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And then in chapter 6 and in verse 20, he says, uh, For which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So, so it's obvious here that Paul he refers to himself as a prisoner twice. He refers to himself as being in chains once. So it's obvious that Paul is in prison when he's writing this book. We know that he was arrested in Jerusalem around 59 AD. We read that in Acts chapter 21. Uh, in Acts chapter 23, we know he's imprisoned in Caesarea for about two years based upon the statement that's made over in chapter uh, 24 and verse 27, uh, that uh, Festus, uh, that is it Felix or Festus, I think uh, Festus comes in and replaces Felix and he wants to do the Jews a favor. Uh, but anyway, it says that he was in prison for about two years there. And then he's eventually moved to Rome and he's in prison there around 62 AD. And we read that in Acts chapter 28. So, so we know that it's most likely during this period while he's imprisoned in Rome, there's some statements made there in Acts chapter 28 concerning the freedoms that he enjoyed, the ability to stay in his own hired house and those sort of things uh, that would give him most likely the time, the ability uh, to, to be able to take uh, the endeavor of writing these letters to the churches. The epistles to the Ephesians, the Colossians, and Philemon, sometimes called the, epi uh, the, the prison epistles, or the prison letters, uh, we know they were carried by Tychi uh, Tychicus. We read here in Act, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 21 that Tychicus delivers this letter to the Ephesians. When we turn over to Colossians, we see that it was Tychicus and Onesimus who delivered that letter. And then, of course, the book of, or the letter of Philemon to Philemon uh, was carried by Onesimus. So same two gentlemen that are, are involved with all three of these sometimes called the prison, or prison epistles. So approximately 62 AD, give or take, uh, is, is likely when this letter was written. The theme of the book, and you know, you, there's as many themes as there are people to, uh, to set them. Uh, the theme that I like, and I, and I base this on the outline that I use, and I'll show you in just a moment, is that Paul is dealing here with our blessings and our responsibilities in Christ. In fact, when you look at this book, it, you can really you can divide it in half. The first three chapters pertain to our blessings in Christ Jesus. And then the last three chapters pertain to our responsibilities in Christ Jesus. And so that's why I say it's the theme. In uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places in Christ. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of Paul, or the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So he, he spends the, the better portion of the first half of the letter talking about all the blessings that we have through Christ. And then as a result of that, uh, we have responsibilities. And he spends uh, the second half of the letter talking about the manner in which we should walk as Christians, the manner in which the Ephesians should walk as Christians. Uh, Brother Harkrider in the workbook uh, says the theme is salvation through Christ by God's eternal plan. That's a good theme too. And we're going to see that a lot, especially in chapter 1. Uh, God's plan for man and his salvation was an eternal plan before the foundations of the world. 
he chose that man would be saved through Christ. Uh, I looked at some other sources. Uh, one gentleman had, I think, 12 or 15 different themes. At, at some point, uh, themes stopped to be a theme and become an outline. But there's a lot of good points in this book, and there's a lot of things worth our consideration. And so it really is kind of hard to just sum it up in a few words. But if I had to, I would, that's what I would say, our blessings and our responsibilities in Christ. So this is the, the outline that I've chosen to use. Again, uh, you know, you can outline a book in a near infinite number of ways and to a near infinite number or a level of detail. But again, the first three chapters, I think, deal with the blessings that we have in Christ. So he has a short uh, salutation or introduction there in the first two verses, and then he dives right into our spiritual blessings. Uh, I hope this morning to cover the first uh, the first four or five verses there through verse six, uh, and I'm calling those blessings from the Father. You could really call this whole section blessings of the Father and the Son, but I, I call it blessings from the Father in the sense that it was God's plan. God instituted this plan. Jesus carries this plan out in verses 7 through 12. And then we see the Spirit's part in verses 13 through 14. And then Paul prays a couple prayers, or he tells them the contents of his prayers in this book a couple times. And the first time we see that is in verses 15 through 22 of the first chapter when he prays for their enlightenment. And then in the second chapter, the blessings continue, but he really is kind of talking here about our spiritual position in Christ. He talks about there in the first 10 verses that we are seated in heaven with Christ. That's the position that, that Christ and that God have put us in through their plan. He talks about there uh, toward the end of the chapter that we are the dwelling of God, the temple, uh, a holy temple in the Lord. That's our position. He goes on in chapter 3, talks about his own position, his stewardship of the gospel. And then at the latter half of that chapter, he prays or he gives them the contents of another one of his prayers. And this prayer is for their strength. And then we move into chapter 4, and here we see that uh, where he implores them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So he, he urges them to walk in unity. And he talks about some proper attitudes that they need in order to walk in unity there in the first six verses. And then he talks about the grace that was given them for edification in the latter uh, verses 7 through 16. And then he urges them to walk in purity. He urges them to walk not as the world, uh, but to be imitators of God, to be children of light, and to walk as wise men. And then in chapter 5 and verse 22, we see that he tells them to walk in harmony. And there he's dealing with husbands and wives. And he uses the example there of Christ and his bride, the church. And then parents and children are to walk in harmony. And masters and slaves are to walk in harmony. And then finally, we see there that section that, you know, maybe is one of the more familiar sections to us, putting on the armor of God, walking in the armor of God, standing in the armor of God. And then finally, he gives some closing uh, exhortations to, to bring the letter to an end. So that's just kind of a brief outline that I plan to follow as we go through this. I find an outline helpful. Uh, it's easy, especially when you're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study, to get bogged down in the verses and kind of lose, uh, lose the whole forest for the trees because you're down in the details and you kind of forget, oh, what, what were we talking about uh, on, 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 a, on a higher level? So this outline is the one I plan to follow as we go through this. So just looking quickly here at the salutation, I know I kind of have a bad habit sometimes of when I'm studying. I don't really spend a lot of time looking at the salutation because, you know, when you write a letter today or you write an email today, we just kind of put dear whoever in there. We don't really give a lot of thought to that. We might not even think of that person we're writing to as being dear to us but it's just a standard greeting. Well, that's not what Paul is doing here. It's not just a standard form greeting like we use uh, when we write letters. Paul is saying some things here that are important, and I think we can get some things out of the salutation that maybe if we don't look at them, we just kind of gloss over and think, well, he's just you know saying hello and, and you know I wish you well. But it's really more than that. He, he begins by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. You remember that he often begins by emphasizing his apostleship when he writes his letters. He doesn't do it in everyone, but he does it in the majority. I'm not going to take the time to turn to all these, but he does it in Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. 
all those books, he says something concerning his apostleship. Here he says it's by the will of God. Some places he says it's by the commandment of Jesus Christ. Other places he says it's not by the agency of man, but in Christ Jesus, he's an apostle. And so uh, this isn't a statement of pride. You know, Paul isn't, you know, walking around like a lot of men today, like the Pharisees of Jesus' time did, wanting people to address him by some name to give him honor and reverence. That's not what Paul's doing. Paul is, I think, out of necessity, emphasizing a fact or a truth. Uh, he spent a good portion of, of the epistle to the Corinthians defending his apostleship, and, and you can understand why, as one born out of due time or out of due season. A lot of people, uh, especially because they probably didn't agree with what Paul had to say, were quick to dismiss him. You know, where was Paul when Jesus was on earth? You know, Paul wasn't with Jesus. You can just hear people kind of discounting Paul. Uh, the Corinthians made fun of his physical appearance, and he addresses that. But he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. This is a statement of fact. It's not Paul trying to puff himself up and, and make himself preeminent. Paul is just saying that, you know, I'm not doing this of my own. I'm doing this by the will of God. He was the one who chose me. He was the one who appointed me. And I, I know that because in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle. That's how Paul really felt. Paul wasn't puffed up by it. Paul didn't wear it like a lot of, quote, reverends and pastors and priests today wear that name proudly so that others will call them by that name, like the rabbis in the first century with Jesus who loved the the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Uh, that wasn't Paul's point at all. Paul was very humble. Paul said, I'm not, I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That's how Paul felt about it. But by the will of God, he was an apostle. And that, I think, should serve as a huge encouragement to us. Turn over with me quickly to 1 Timothy and recall here the things Paul wrote to Timothy concerning his apostleship. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. I would imagine if, if we all got to dredging through the past and, and digging up and thinking about our sins, there are many things in our lives that we're embarrassed and ashamed of, and there's probably some things that you know are, are quite terrible. But I would imagine that the majority of us never broke into anybody's home and drug them out and had them put in prison and gave our voice against them to have them put to death like the Apostle Paul did. He said, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, did some terrible things. I don't know that he ever, uh, we never read of him actually picking up the stone to stone somebody, but we do read that he consented to their death. And so Paul's got all this baggage. Paul goes from being um, enemy number one in a lot of ways of Christians in the early church to being one of them and to be by the will of God an apostle, one, one sent by the Lord. And so that ought to serve as a huge source of encouragement to us. That if God was willing to forgive and God was willing to utilize Paul for his purposes, he can do the same with you and I. And so when we read that statement, which we, I, I gloss over a lot, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, there's a lot there for us to digest and to learn and to take encouragement from. He goes on and he says to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. We talked about this briefly in our introduction, but you know this is really an excellent biblical definition of a saint. Because I want you to notice that the saints are. 
The saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful. They're not, they, they, weren't, they didn't used to be at Ephesus. They didn't used to be faithful, or they were faithful at one point, but now they're dead. No, they are. They're alive. Uh, if you are familiar with the way the religious world uses the word saint quite often, especially the Catholics, the New, the new Oxford American Dictionary says a person formerly, formally recognized or canonized by the church after death who may be the object of veneration and prayers for intercession. Well, that's not what we read here, is it? Paul isn't talking, addressing a letter to dead people. Paul isn't venerating them and offering prayers of intercession to them. Paul is calling living people who are faithful in Christ, he's calling them saints. And so that's an excellent definition of what a saint is. It's not a person that's been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. The word there that's uh, translated faithful, Thayer says that it means trusty or faithful. He says, of persons who show themselves faithful in the transaction of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. I think that's a really good definition, one that I want us to, to put in our minds because we're going to refer back to it here in just a few moments. But he's saying that these people are trustworthy. They're trusty. He says that they discharge their duties, that they execute their commands. So the faithful, he says, in Christ Jesus, the trusty, those who can be relied upon, those who are doing the things that they ought to be doing, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And he says grace to you, grace to you and peace. The word grace means merciful kindness. So grace to you, merciful kindness to you. He says peace. I like this definition of peace by Thayer. It says the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. Peace. You know, a lot of times we think of peace, we think of, you know, no threats against us. But that's not really what the word here means as, as Thayer defines it. Tranquil state, you know, we can all have that peaceful state, that, that feeling of peace, knowing that we're right with God, knowing that we've been reconciled to him, that our sins are remembered against us no more. And as a result of that, we can be content with our earthly lot, even though our earthly lot may not be peaceful at all. We may be facing persecution. We may be in the midst of war. We may be in the midst of, of just tremendous physical uh, ailments, trials of life, death but we can have peace. And that's what Paul wishes them here, grace and peace, merciful kindness. He says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminded me of the passage that we studied a few months ago back this fall in James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above. And so when he wishes them grace, when he wishes them peace, there's no better place, there's no place that they can receive such grace and such peace from other than heaven itself, from God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son. Because every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above. So he wishes grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Any questions, any comments on these first two verses before we move on? So now we're going to move into the, the blessings, the spiritual blessings that we have through the Father, or from the Father. He says in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So you see here that he's talking about the things that God did to bring about these spiritual blessings for us, these spiritual blessings that he has bestowed upon us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word blessed there means worthy of praise or blessing. That's William Mounts' uh, definition. 
Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how true that is when you consider what he goes on to say, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So worthy of praise is our Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. The word blessing there is the same Greek word, a little bit different form of it. It has a little bit different meaning. And it just means a benefit bestowed, Vine says. You know, sometimes when we're uh, maybe looking at jobs, one of the things besides pay that we, we look at first is our benefits, right? You know, what, how much time off do I receive? How much do they contribute toward retirement? How much do they offer toward my health care expenses? All these what we call benefits of the job. Well, b- blessed or worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual benefit. All of them are ours. And so God deserves praise. God is worthy of praise of what he has done for us. I want us just to to quickly look at the spiritual blessings. We'll look at them in more detail as we go through the verses. But just just want to catalog them or list them here, the ones that he mentions in verses 4 through 14. And I may have missed some, and you can point those out to me. But the first one that I see is in verse 4, that we would be holy and blameless before him. We can't be holy and blameless without him. It took Christ to make us holy and blameless. He gave us adoption as sons, verse 5 says. You think about being an orphan child, not having parents, not having anybody to, to love you, to provide you. Well, that's, that's the, the image that we get here. He adopted us. He took us in. Verse 6 says, his grace which he freely bestowed on us. His unmerited favor, that which we didn't deserve, he bestowed upon us freely. Isn't that a wonderful spiritual blessing? We have redemption, he says in verse 7, forgiveness of our trespasses. Verse 8, or verse 7 and 8, he says, the riches of his grace which he lavished on us, very similar to the grace which he freely bestowed upon us, but he lavished it upon us. Has anybody ever lavished anything upon you? Maybe a a spouse, maybe a significant other. Uh, You know, they want to show you how much that you mean to them, and so they lavish you with praise or they lavish you with with gifts. Well, that's the, the image that we get here of God lavishing his grace, the riches of his grace upon us. What a wonderful spiritual blessing. He goes on in verse 9, he says, He made known to us the mystery of his will. That was essential. If we don't have that, then we can't be saved. We can't understand God's will, then we don't know what we're supposed to do. But he made known the mystery of his will to us. What a great spiritual blessing. We have obtained an inheritance. And we, we understand what an inheritance is when it comes to things of this life, when you know that proverbial rich uncle dies and he leaves us the, you know, the <laughs> leaves us the farm. Well, you know, that's a wonderful blessing, isn't it, in some ways? But what Christ has blessed us with, what God has blessed us with, this inheritance is not one that is defiled. It's one that will not fade away. And then finally we read in verse 13 that he sealed, uh, that we are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. And so there we see the Holy Spirit's part in our salvation. And certainly that is a spiritual blessing that we have received. So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, he says. And then in verse 14, he he. He calls us God's own possession. You know, we're not just nobodies. We're not just common people who, you know, are of no value. We are God's own possession. He chose us. So these are all blessings that I read that that Paul mentions here in these handful of verses. And he goes on and he says, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The word here that's translated heavenly places is the Greek word that you see here. And I'm not going to try to pronounce these because uh, I can do it at home. But when I get up here, my tongue gets tied. But it just means heavenly. What pertains to or is in heaven. And this is Vine's definition. And he says epi, that's the prefix, the EP that you see at the beginning of that word. The arenios uh, is the word for heaven, but this is epi or epirenos. So 
in the sense of pertaining to, not here, but above. So these things pertain to heaven. And so that's the reason the translators uh, translated the word in the heavenly places, pertaining to heaven, of heaven, above. They're not here. And so uh, it occurs, this expression occurs nowhere else in the New Testament to my knowledge, but five times Paul uses it, this Greek word, here in the book or the letter of Ephesians. And I'm not going to take the time to turn to these. We'll, we'll address them when we get to them. But it's here in verse 3. It's later in verse 20. Then in chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 10. And then in chapter 6, verse 12. Heavenly places is the way it's translated. So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. And again, it makes me think of that passage that we mentioned a moment ago, James 1, verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. You know, this world is not a place of, of spiritual blessings. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the statement that, that John makes in 1 John concerning all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. That's, that's what this world is made up of. But these spiritual blessings, they're from the heavenly places. They're in the heavenly places. They're not from this world. They're of God. Any questions, any comments on this verse? In verse 4, he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. This verse simply states that God formed the plan of saving man from sin through his son before the world existed. That's all this verse says. And if you read this verse without the influence of the false doctrine of predestination, I think that's the interpretation that you'd come away from. He chose us in him. So it states that God formed the plan of saving man from sin through his son. He did so before the world existed. I want you to notice God's plan was not specifically who, that is, which individuals would be saved, but specifically where or by whom they would be saved. In Christ, by Christ. And, and it's, it's emphasized here because each and every verse, from verse 13 to verse 14, he tells us that. And there's a lot of repetition, repetition here. He says, in Christ, in verse 3. Verse 4, in Him. Verse 5, through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, in the beloved. Verse 7, in Him. Verse 8, in Him. Verse 9, in Him. Verse 10, in Christ. And then at the end of that verse, it says, in Him. And that really should go with verse 11. So really, verse 11 also contains that reminder that it's in Him. And then in verse 12, in Christ. And then in verse 13, twice, we see at the beginning and at the end, in Him, in Him. So God's plan was not specifically who would be saved, which individuals would be saved, which is what the doctrine of predestination teaches, but rather it's where the saved would be saved. That is, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ. Unfortunately, as we've already alluded to, a lot of people use Ephesians chapter 1 as a proof text for a false doctrine. Uh, it's called predestination. If you're not familiar with predestination, the New Oxford American Dictionary says, as a doctrine in Christian theology, the divine foreordaining of all that will happen, especially with regard to the salvation of some and not of others. It has particularly been associated with the teachings of St. Augustine of Hippo and of John Calvin. We're probably more familiar with Calvin's teaching of predestination. You might have heard it referred to as unconditional election. Unconditional election, also called sovereign election, asserts that God has chosen from eternity those whom he will bring to himself, not based on foreseen virtue, merit, or faith in those person or people. Rather, his choice is unconditionally grounded in his mercy alone. God has chosen from eternity to extend mercy to those he has chosen and to withhold mercy from those not chosen. Those chosen receive salvation through Christ alone, those not chosen receive the just wrath that is warranted for their sins against God. That's an excerpt from an article on Wikipedia concerning the five points of Calvinism. So there, in a nutshell, is the doctrine of predestination. That before the foundations of the world, God chose who would be saved and who would be lost. 
So let's think about that for a moment with the few minutes that we have remaining. The doctrine of predestination contradicts the rest of the scriptures. And if we realize that, then we realize that that cannot possibly be the interpretation that we apply to Ephesians chapter 1. Because to do so contradicts with the entire rest of the Bible. And not only that, but it results in God being a tyrant, doesn't it? I don't know what else to call him. If God chose some people to be saved and some people to be lost, and he did it not based on their faith, and he did it not based on any thing that they did other than just arbitrarily choosing some people to be saved and some people to be lost, then that makes him a tyrant. Because that's the definition of a tyrant, a person exercising power or control in a cruel, unreasonable, or arbitrary way. We know what tyrants are. We read about a tyrant over in Genesis. Pharaoh was a tyrant. Adolf Hitler was a tyrant. And if God, this doctrine of predestination is to be believed, then God is a tyrant because he chose some people to be saved and some people to be lost just on a whim. Let's look at these verses real quickly. John 3, verse 16 through 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, if predestination is true, that's a false statement because it's not whoever. It's the few that God chose to be saved or not necessarily the few, but the ones who God chose to be saved. But the verse says, whoever believes. He goes on, verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Well, is that really the world? Well, if predestination is true, it's not really the world. It's just the subset of the world that God chose to save. But that's not what the verse says. God, the verse says that whoever believes that Jesus was sent to save the world, not just a portion or a segment of the world. Titus 2 verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Well, that's not a true statement if predestination is to be believed because it's not all men. It's just a subset of men. It's the one who God chose to save. And then 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4, we'll stop here. God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Well, that's not a true statement if predestination is true because God doesn't desire all men to be saved. God desires just a subset, the ones that he chose back before the foundation of the world. Those are the ones that God desires to be saved, and the rest he desires to be lost. But again, that's not what the verse says. So we clearly see the contradiction between the Scriptures and what the doctrine of predestination teaches. So keep that in your mind this week as you study this passage and as you read these verses. And even though you see the word predestined, it's not the way that men define it. Thank you for your attention.